Welcome to Train Free Dive. <laughs> Don't laugh. I didn't laugh. <laughs> Welcome to Train Freediving. I'm Sarah and this is my pool competition training vlog number one. I wanted to do a on the couch with my coach training vlog because I want to show you what goes into training for a competition week after week. And when I first started, I had no real clue what I was doing, what exercise I should be doing week on week. And to be completely honest, I don't even think I do now. Um, thankfully, I have a really amazing coach who also happens to be my boyfriend, so he has no choice. <laughs> uh -huh. um, but yeah, the important thing is, is I can show you from my side of things how training should feel how enjoyable training can be um, but Nathan's here because he knows all the kind of theory and he also knows actually what we're doing so I thought it was a good opportunity to get us both on the couch see it from my point of view but also um, get yeah get what you should be doing in the pool from Nathan um, so it's week number one and um, we've just started today and I want to just check in with Nathan about the exercises that we do because, again, as I said, I never really know before we start a session what exercises, exercises I'm going to be doing. And I kind of like it that way. I have a very busy job um, and training and freediving is my kind of hobby and my outlet. So I just like to show up at the pool and get told what to do, basically. Um, so today we had a session and I'm going to take it over to Nathan who's going to tell you what we actually did. Today you did to start two times eight by 30 meter CO2 tables and we used an ascending recovery strategy so you start with a low number of breaths between the first lap and then you were adding a breath between each lap and the point of that was to increase your CO2, decrease your oxygen levels in your muscles and then as the table progressed as the rate of CO2 production would increase, we're adding breaths to make sure that the table didn't become too challenging or too hard at the end. And then to finish things off, I had you do three times 60 meters. So why do uh, you not want to make things challenging? Like for doing a CO2 table, why do you want it to feel good? Why shouldn't it be like, why shouldn't I be like itching for it to be over at the end? Why shouldn't I be pushing to my max? Well, I think this is kind of like, with this type of training, we're investing in the future. So we want you to have the best possible performance in your competition two months from now. And pushing yourself as hard as possible, making sure, like trying to suffer, trying to have the m most challenging breath holds, the most contractions, the most lactic acid right now, isn't going to serve that purpose. It's just going to make you tired two months in advance and then being able to stay consistent with the training for two entire months, for one, isn't going to be possible. And then the second issue with that is if you're pushing yourself so hard that you're creating mental and physical stress around the dive, so we're not, at this point we're not challenging ourselves, we're stressing ourselves out. And if you're doing that really at all, instead of creating adaptation, you're just going to create like a protective mechanism where your mind and your body don't want to do the exercise. Mm -hmm. It perceives it as something dangerous, something that could be potentially harmful, and you're going to start to reject the training. Mm. So by starting easy, at, at by starting with exercises that are well within your capability, we'll, we're giving ourselves the opportunity to make them increase in difficulty steadily mm. so that the actual like challenge level doesn't go up even though the exercise is becoming more difficult towards the end of your training cycle closer to your competition. So you got me to do the two times 30 meter CO decreasing CO2 table and the first set that I did I actually messed it up a bit <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I was supposed to take uh, two breaths after 30 meters and then go up to three breaths, four breaths, five breaths, all the way up to eight breaths and I actually snuck in 
in the first two extra breaths. So I got told off by coach for doing that, but it was it was an accident. Um, but the actual the one where I got it right. So I was I did a 30 meter and then I took one breath, and then I took another breath, and then just went. And that's the right way to do the exercise, right? I think the actual number of breaths, not just the one that the number of breaths that we start at. So in your case, I wanted you to start with two between the first two laps. The number of breaths is going to depend on the person. Mm. So some people might need to start at three. Some people might need to start at only one. For some people, it might increase by one breath per lap. For some people, it might increase for one breath per lap for half the table and then stop at a certain number. So that was something that you even mentioned today is that you felt that you could stop increasing number of breaths at five and then finish the last three to four laps with only five breaths recovery. So, But how does somebody know where they should start? You know, like, again, you tell me what to do, but how does somebody at home know how many breaths to take in between each 30 meter dive? The honest answer is experimentation, where you really need to know, and this is different because I've been training you for a few years now and I know exactly what your dives feel like with lots of feedback from you, but the idea is to understand, number one, what your table should feel like. So in this case, we were trying to have mild urge to breathe, mild hypoxia in the muscles, but no contractions, no serious strong urge to breathe. So we know what the table should feel like. And then you need to experiment a little bit with how you approach that. And, you know, the way th when you said you cheated or you messed up the first table, that actually counts as experimentation because mm -hmm. maybe subconsciously you started it a little bit easier than I suggested because you've never done it this way before and you wanted to feel how it would go. But I would say f for most people, they could probably start at four breaths between the first lap mm. and then add one breath per lap for eight laps total. And then within even one session, you could make very big changes, either adding or removing breaths mm. for three repetitions of the same exercise just to find out, okay, how does it feel if I do it with this? How does it feel if I do it with that? Mm. And then you can very quickly come to a conclusion as to what the average way to do this exercise is best for you and then moving forward you can adjust it from there. It's super interesting that you talk about this idea of like experimentation <coughs> and just getting curious I guess in a really non-judgmental way because even now like after diving for three years and doing like various competitions still in my training probably if I'm honest like before every session I get a little bit nervous about the exercises and again you know maybe you know, like I said that's why I don't like to know just as I arrive at, at the um, pool edge I kind of get told what I'm going to do and maybe that's why because I don't like to get too in my head about doing these perfect training dives which is very much something that I would do so um, yeah I think it's interesting that maybe in the first round of doing that exercise I kind of cheated because I think probably subconsciously I was nervous about whether I'd be able to do the whole table and what it would feel like um, and I'm someone who very much has to have my diving feel really nice and really good and like I very rarely have contractions if ever actually um, so maybe yeah I subconsciously kind of sabotaged it a little bit at the beginning um, mm. to make sure that it was going to feel good but once I knew that I had it and once I knew that actually by the time I got to the 6th, 7th, 8th lap, I didn't actually need the six, seven, eight breaths. I could have done very well with five breaths. When I went to the second round of doing the exercise, I was quite happy to do um, yeah, the two breaths, three breaths, exactly like you said. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the way it felt for me actually was that when I did do it in the correct way, I think, yeah, it, it got hard fast within the first like first and second lap um, but I still didn't really have for me personally any urge to breathe um, I did feel on the first lap or the return of the 
you know, second lap. Um, I'd say probably slightly hypoxic, but then as I progressed throughout the exercise, it just got easier and easier and more enjoyable. And actually, I was able to kind of, I guess, shift my focus from thinking about my breathing to actually shift my focus to thinking about my technique, which is kind of what I did, and I was using it as more of a technique exercise towards the end. Do you, do you think that that's okay? Do you think that what I'm, what I experienced and what I felt and what I went through was was good? <coughs> yeah, I think. I mean, like, in terms of what you just said at the end there, using the exercise to play with your technique, I think that especially at the beginning of a training period, so. Right now is where we're first decided to dedicate proper training for a competition. That should be the point. So the exercises should always be, they should feel at least physically and mentally quite easy to do. No serious urge to breathe, no serious doubts onto whether or not you can finish the actual table, especially while you're doing it. Because you should be giving yourself that place to be working on your technique, getting in laps, getting in volume, total meters per session to really work on the finning. Mm. And then I would say that I, I wouldn't, the feeling of hypoxia, in my opinion, isn't hypoxia. Mm. So I think that when you hold your breath, you're, if you hold your breath and then interrupt it with just one breath, mm. basically one breath recovery, you're messing up with your blood pressure. So your heart rate's gonna try and increase and your blood pressure will drop on that one breath but then as soon as you go back underwater your heart rate tries to drop again right. and your blood pressure goes up so that could cause feelings that are similar to hypoxia Got ya. guaranteed after just 35 meters you're not hypoxic yeah that would be worrying <laughs> but again this type of table is designed in a way and whether it's like with any of these types of co2 or hypoxia drills that are short recoveries and short distances they're designed to kind of create sensations that you might experience more to the end mm. of your breath hold but as early as possible and that way where let's say you just did a max dive you would only experience these types of sensations once and only right at the end like you, you have to go through 120 meters of diving before you can even feel anything mm. where on these types of tables you can feel it two three four five maybe even six times for the entire set of breath holds mm. for two sets and on top of it, you're doing it on very easy distances. So mm. you have like a mental space to feel that sensation, adapt to that sensation without the stress of having to do a max attempt and having to do a 10 minute recovery, breathe up for your next one, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so after we did the two times 30 CO2 table, you have me do uh, three times 60, or actually it was a four times 60, but then I did three times 60. Um, in my own time, whenever I felt like it, with my own kind of breathe up. Now, what was the point of? <coughs> excuse me. What was the point of doing that exercise after the CO2 table exercise? Mm. <coughs> so something like in the pool repetitions of 50. Excuse me, repetitions of 50, or in our case, 60, because we have a 30 meter pool is really just an exercise designed to build volume into your session. So we're kind of just adding meters to the session, getting you finning, holding your breath for longer than if you just did the CO2 table mm. and left, you know? Sorry, I need to burp. <laughs> <laughs> so what, why do I need to get in a volume early in my training cycle? What's the benefit of that? Yeah, so, I mean, for most, in the most general sense, you always want to start your training cycles with lower intensity diving. So the total meters, minutes, or seconds per dive is going to be lower, so far from your personal best. But you want to have plenty of meters or seconds per session. And the general reason for doing this is it's going to give you time to get back in touch with your technique. If you just did two times 100 in one session, that's only 200 meters worth of technical practice. But mm -hmm. in today's session, we did like around 700 and just uh, it's just under 700 meters for the session. So that's, um, what is it, 
more than three times as much technical practice as if we just did 200 meter dives, for example. Mm. Now, in your particular case, something that I've noticed that you struggle with in general is that as the volume increases through the session, your technical ability decreases. So yeah. the more dives you do, your technique starts to deteriorate, you start to have trouble maintaining good technique through the um, the, through the laps, mm. and the actual quality of your dives, so the, the way they feel, starts to deteriorate really quickly. So you'll, have, you'll be able to maintain a good level of diving, and then all of a sudden you get really fatigued very quickly mm. at the end of the session. So for now, I'm trying to build your total meters per session. I want to get it somewhere close to 800 per session, comfortable, which is going to be five times, or about five times your actual goal. And I know that if, if you can do that, if you're comfortable finning for five times your goal, when it comes time to doing lower volume sessions later on, where we're maybe doing repetitions of 90 or 100 meters, you're going to be able to do all three reps with really good quality mm. without getting fatigued, without having one dive feel harder than the first two. Mm. And then that type of training later on is what's really going to build your overall freediving fitness for you to actually achieve your goal. Mm. So, as you said, when I'm doing more volume or later in my session, I know that, yeah, something I struggle with is I get fatigued and... Um, Part of that is I have an injury, so I have a, um, a lower back, a uh, couple problems with my lower back. I actually fractured it two years ago, and I have a thing called spondylolisthesis, which means I don't actually have um, any discs left in the lower part of my spine, so my mobility can suffer as a result. How much do you think at this stage I should be doing kind of other strength um, and mobility in general, like conditioning, alongside my, my freedive training or do you think that me just doing the pool exercises is enough and getting the right volume in is, is enough to make sure that I have good technique? Mm. I think so the, the answer I'm going to give is actually going to be quite contradictory because in most people's cases from a freediving perspective being two months away from competition I would say that external training, cross training, going to the gym, doing that type of stuff isn't going to be very important. Right. So really in terms of making sure that you have good technique, good quality dives, that you're capable of hitting the volume markers that we want to hit, normally the vast majority of that is going to come from diving itself. However, knowing you personally, you've not been going to the gym to do proper like barbell strength training for a while and because those back muscles are so important for you to make sure that your spine is stabilized make sure that nothing's shifting in and out of position I would say that in your case getting maybe three to four weeks of two to three gym sessions per week is going to be quite important just to make sure that your back muscles and your spine isn't taking any type of unnecessary wear and tear. And on top of that, Sarah is someone who does very well with low frequency training. So for Sarah, training for a pool competition, we're going to be doing maximum two sessions per week. Where for most people, I think they would require three to four sessions per week to get the same type of results that you're getting. But for some reason, you respond quite well to training. And two sessions a week works really well. Mm. And that means you'll have more energy to spend on gym training at the moment. And it, it's not going to like, it's not going to hamper you or um, cause any type of side effects like it would for someone who might need... If someone needed four sessions per week of pool training and three gym sessions, it would be impossible. They'd yeah. overtrain almost right away. Yeah. So it's interesting, <coughs> like... You know, there, y what you're saying is there is a kind of generalized approach to uh, sports um, science freedive training, 
but there is also individual cases and obviously for someone like me I do have a back injury and um, <coughs> I also you know the type of person that I am and my physique and things like that does also impact on on my training plan and potentially that's why it's useful to maybe seek out some advice as well about what what you're doing and what people are working on right yeah yeah I mean like I would say in general it's relatively easy to create a basic training plan for most people to understand okay you have this many months to train you should be roughly doing this many sessions per week this many meters per session this many dives per session etc cetera, etc cetera. however you always need to consider individual factors mm. at the end of doing that mm. so you make this general approach and then you have to consider does the person have previous sporting history does they have do they have injuries like in your case do you have a back injury that we need to take special care to make sure that the muscles are conditioned and strengthened otherwise your monofin technique is going to hurt you and doing too much monofin technique does hurt you so we have to limit your sessions per week yeah you also need to consider um It's not just Sorry. it's not just just physical either. I'd say because when I was you, I was listening to you talk about me and like how I benefit more from doing just like more like two sessions a week rather than more than that. I was thinking that yes, like I have an injury which can sometimes mean like too much is actually like counterproductive. <coughs> but I think certainly what I've learned from my last two training cycles with doing pool competitions is that mentally if i'm actually investing too much in my in my training like if it's kind of like everything in my life that gets really into my head and can actually cause me to sabotage my training because i almost i put too much pressure on myself too much pressure to perform Whereas if I have a more balanced approach and I'm doing other things such as working and like having a social life as well as my training, that that means that um, I actually end up performing better, um, and that is something that we realised, particularly in the in the last training cycle when I was doing a, f a further distance, and I thought, right, I have to take some time off of all this competition and focus just solely on this competition, and I'm going to rest, and I'm not going to do anything else, and I'm going to do, you know, this meditation and stretching, and actually at the end of it, it stressed me out doing that. So. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting what you're saying. I think it's not just physical, but it's also mental. So getting to know yourself and how you perform best is really important for your training. Yeah, so I think it's really important to say that in, in Sarah's case, she's very clear to me and even to herself that training and competing is a hobby. So she's not doing this because she's trying to get sponsorship. She's not doing this because if she does 200 meters dynamic, she's going to get coaching clients or be a better instructor or have more instructor clients. You know, none yeah, I, I don't actually coach freediving <laughs> or instruct freediving. I do write about freediving, but um, yeah, I'm I've I'm no interest in doing this for for I guess uh, yeah. Yeah. So coaching. so for her, for her, there's no. Like w this, the competition and the training is all about having fun. It's all about enjoying the process as much as possible, and it's about finding relaxation and enjoyment. So maybe a third session in the week could get a few percent added performance at the end of a training cycle, but for Sarah, losing the ability to have a balanced lifestyle, losing the ability to have that one extra day off from work or that one extra day to go on a hike or go swimming or go see your friends isn't worth the five to six meters extra performance that it's going to get her. Now in my case, I actually do quite well with three sessions a week, but I'm willing to push myself to do a fourth session because that extra session is what I need to get an extra two to three meters out of my training. Mm. And I do this as a job. I, I mm. compete because I'm trying to get sponsorship. 
I'm trying to get the best numbers possible to attract the coaching clients to attract future it's not just you know that I think like you know yes mm. okay there's a business side of this where you're trying to do that but you don't you don't compete as an athlete in order to do those things that's not what motivates you what drives you is actually like dissecting training and understanding all of the various components so that you can get the absolute best results for yourself and for others like that's what drives you so having those extra days of training or those extra sessions is like one more opportunity for you to learn and understand about the sport of freediving is what I think yeah I mean that's that's probably the better answer and the better way of explaining it that's what her job is by the way <laughs> <laughs> but I'd say that yeah I for what for all the reasons that are included in there when I'm training I treat it like it is my job it is my profession it is my passion well it is it and is. I'm, I'm for me I'm willing to sacrifice everything else for that one extra day of training where for you you're you you're willing to sacrifice that one extra day of training to have everything else. That's why Nathan has to have a girlfriend who loves free diving, <laughs> because otherwise it wouldn't work. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, yeah, that's totally true. But um, yeah, so so that's week one of my training, and we should say that right now. How many weeks are we until my next competition? We're not 100 percent sure <laughs> when the trump will be, but. Roughly eight to ten weeks away from competition. Yeah, we've got eight to ten weeks, which is actually more than I've kind of ever had before. Um, and I already have been doing kind of intermittent pool training anyway. Um, but yeah, this is the start of that. And every week we're going to share a kind of on the sofa with Sarah and Nathan. So we hope that you'll join us again then. And we'll keep you updated about what I'm doing and why. And hopefully this will also benefit your training whenever you guys can get back in the pool. Bye for now.